<laughs> we have a very special guest tonight. Uh, I did a, uh, an event for my book at the Gardena Kiwanis, and afterwards I was speaking with a gentleman who is the owner of Gardena Nissan. And I was talking to him about uh, some of the articles I've written about local history. And he said, well, then I think you should really talk to Mr. Roy Pershy. Pershy sounds very similar to Street Perchy. Most people don't realize that our street is misnamed. It should have been Pershy. Mr. Roy Pershy's family farmed this whole area way back when. And because of a snafu in the uh, deeds and the land grants, you're all trespassing right now. He still owns it, so you have to, no. So, <laughs> so anyways, he is here tonight, and he's going to talk to us about the Gardena Valley, some of the history about farming in the area, about where his family farmed, and also about uh, the Pershing name. So, Mr. Roy Pershing. Thank you. I happen to be the third generation uh, in this area, and uh, I was telling Mr. Lynch, it's a little over 70 years ago was the last time I trod on this land right here until tonight. Both my grandfathers are of German descent. My grandfather, Percy, was a uh, pastry baker as well as a bread baker. He looked down on bread bakers. They, they were a level below him. And uh, he immigrated from uh, Donuts area of Germany, and uh, which is in the western part, and uh, came to Ellis Island and landed in Chicago. He didn't like Chicago, so he decided to go to Seattle. Well, that climate there didn't agree to him, and he found himself in sun, uh, sunny, uh, sunny uh, California. Uh, he found a location at the corner of uh, Washington and Grand, and, and this was uh, just before 1900. And uh, believe it or not, Washington Boulevard, that was the end of L.A. It was a dirt street. He uh, bought a, a business that was a restaurant and a bakery, and he went back to Germany and brought my grandmother back. And uh, she operated the restaurant, and uh, uh, he operated the bakery. After a period of time, uh, his health uh, started going downhill, and his doctor informed him that if he was going to continue in the business he was in, he better buy a cemetery plot. So uh, they decided to sell the bakery and, and restaurant, and they uh, found uh, 40 acres out at Palms, which is part of Venice today. It lies between Venice and uh, the Howard Hughes uh, operation that's now gone. And uh, they farmed there for a number of years, and uh, because the uh, Baluna Creek hadn't been opened up by the Corps of Engineers, uh, the lower end of their ranch would flood at times in the wintertime. So I don't know how my grandfather got word of the 80 acres just south of here, starting at 154th Street and going down to Manhattan Beach Boulevard. And it had been an old alfalfa ranch and dairy, and, and uh, they sold the land in Culver City and moved here. Uh, my other grandfather, original name was Schmidt, but uh, here in the, in the U.S. they changed it to Smith. And uh, in the late 1800s, uh, farming in Ohio got got to be quite difficult, and his brothers all got jobs on the B&O Railroad, Baltimore and Ohio, for you that <laughs> don't remember back when. Uh, he couldn't get a job, so he came out to California and hired on uh, with General Rosecrans. Now, the Rosecrans Ranch started at the corner of Rosecrans and Vermont. 
and uh, he worked there for a period of time and times were tough and General Rosecrans couldn't pay him any more than uh, room and board, no wages. It was $30 a month then. So uh, he wanted to go on his own and he found some land up at uh, Imperial and Crenshaw and uh, General Rosecrans gave him four old worn out horses and a plow. So he started, uh, this is before 1900 now, and uh, they were in such bad shape he couldn't work them during the daytime because of the heat. So about this time in the evening he'd harness them up and go out and work till two or four in the morning. And he was lucky he had a good crop and from then on things uh, prospered for him and I'll leave that part of the family out now. But going back to the history of, of, um, of California, topog topography played a big part. And when the Spaniards came north out of Mexico, uh, they followed the easy trails that mostly the Indians had made. And roughly every 20 miles, uh, they set up what, a, a, a mission site. And uh, does anyone know the prime re requisite for these sites? Water? Clay soil? <laughs> no, I heard someone say water. Water, water. water is number one. You know, <laughs> if you travel up in the valley uh, on the major freeways, you see big signs that they said, where water flow, crops grow. Mm -hmm. You can have the best soil in the world, but no water, and it isn't worth much. So, uh, it wound up that uh, at each one of these mission sites, they left a few soldiers uh, to keep control in case they had any problems with the Indians. One of the soldiers by the name of Dominguez served out his time, and at that period of time, the King of Spain said that if you can ride a horse from dawn to dark, you can have all that land. Well, he got on his horse at the mouth of the L.A. River, followed it up to Rosecrans, and then out to the ocean. So this became part of the Dominguez land grant. Now, Dominguez built his home, and it's, if, I don't know if any of you have visited the Dominguez Adobe, it's over up, right off of Alameda Street. He had, uh, unfortunately, he wasn't blessed with sons, he had daughters. And uh, uh, sailing sh for the first sailing ships came into the San Pedro area, but because of the marshland, it was not a good harbor. Well, one of the sailors jumped ship, and his name was uh, Watson. Well, he met, wound up marrying one of the daughters and generous papa. Guess what? 5,000 acre dowry. Then along came Jamie Del Amo, which is all of Torrance today in Redondo. Same thing. Well, Dominguez had so much land, he didn't know what to do with it. The big thing in those days was cattle, because in Europe they wanted tallow and the hides. There was no refrigeration, so meat meant nothing. So. Along came a family called the, Sepo the uh, Sepulvedas, and they settled in the San Pedro area, and they started running cattle on all of the Palo Verde's hills. And uh, Mr. Dominguez didn't care, he had so much land. And then one day it came upon him that, hey, these people are trespassers. Well, because they had had the land for so many years, he lost out in court. And the Sepulveda is wound up with all of the Palos Verdes Peninsula and what is now San Pedro and part of Wilmington. Well, then they fell on some hard times and along came the Vanderlip family that bought most of the Palo Verde Hills. And uh, during this time, when my grandfather Smith first came out here, 
they had a drought and there wasn't enough feed for all the cattle and this is hard to believe. They didn't have money to buy the gunpowder or the bullets so they took the cattle and ran them up on the Palisades Hills and ran them over the bluffs. Wow. And that's the way they killed the cattle. Wow. Sad situation. <laughs> so down, down through the years various people came and bought land from the, the Dominguez family or, or uh, uh, the Delamo family or any of the other heirs. And uh, at, <clears throat> prior to World War I, everything in this area started booming. And uh, uh, this was before the PE Railway was envisioned. And we had uh, three areas right here locally called Gardena, Monita, and Western City. Where we're at was western part of Western City. Now, after, when the railroad was put through, mainly because they hadn't tried to develop the L.A. Harbor, Redondo had the best harbor. And so they built a long pier out. Part of it is the same pier that's there today, but the pier then went much further out. And the lumber schooners from up north brought their uh, lumber down and they unloaded it there in the pier under the railroad cars and then it was dispersed throughout Southern California. And at the same time, uh, Redondo became known as the summer vacation area because they had a nice cool breeze there in the summer and people in say in the San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles, nothing to have a 110 degree day. Come to Redondo and stay for a couple of weeks or a month and so it became a vacation area as well. Well, like I was saying, my grandfather Percy found this land here uh, just prior to World War uh, one, and it was an alfalfa field. So they started farming here, and at the same time, there in Manita, it was the crux of all the heavy-duty uh, operation. Uh, where the I'm sure you all know where the uh, uh, Crenshaw Lumber Company is now. Well, and the railroad spur that runs through there was the railroad that went to Redondo originally. On the very corner uh, of, of 166th and Western Avenue, you had the uh, uh, Drage Company that uh, had uh, old Bulldog Mack trucks with a big, wide, solid tired, uh, tires on it. And they hauled steel from the Wellen Steel Plant, which later became Columbia Steel and then U.S. Steel out of Torrance. And they also sold uh, supplies from uh, seeds to fertilizer to baling wire. I hauled many a load of baling wire out of, out of their warehouse right there on the corner. But across the track from them was the Manita Vegetable Cannery. And the farmers here locally that grew things like tomatoes and, and uh, other crops that could be canned, uh, they took them there. Next door to uh, the trucking company was the Manita Vegetable Exchange. And uh, there, uh, loads of lettuce, cabbage, cauliflower, tomatoes, you name it, were loaded. But those days there was no refrigeration. So after the cars were loaded, they were pushed over to the ice plant where they were topped iced and then they had to be re-iced maybe several times depending on where they, the destination was. My grandfather shipped many a load of uh, vegetables out of, out of there from this land just to the south. And uh, then uh, next 
door to it was a, a standard oil distribution plant. And uh, during the depression, it was unfortunate, the engineer on the locomotive humped the car in at too high a speed, loaded with gasoline, and it hit the abutment at the end, and it, the seams split open, and Fire Chief Bathrick uh, attempted to uh, stem the flow of gasoline, and from somewhere there was ignition, and the explosion uh, killed him instantly and blew 50 gallon oil drums a block away. I happened to be outside there next door to Guardian and Nissan where our family home was at that time and the sky just turned a dull red. I can remember that. On the, But back to the farming, after World War uh, one, there was a slight depression and then uh, there was a great expansion and people from all over came and started buying land in 20 acre parcels, 40 acre parcels, and part of this ranch, which was called the Dickinson Ranch, uh, their main headquarters over what would be now 154th and Western Avenue, that's where their well was, and they had pipelines that came all the way over to Crenshaw here to provide water for irrigation. Uh, other ranches around here, across uh, Crenshaw was the Mauer Ranch, which we farmed. Then on the other side of the, of the uh, which is now called the Dominguez Channel, we had the, the Bodger Ranch. And the Bodgers came from England, and they were primarily uh, in the sweet pea seed raising business. And they had several hundred acres of sweet peas, and uh, this time of year, the sweet peas would be getting ready to bloom, and people would come out by the hundreds on weekends to see the sweet peas and picnic and so on. And... Uh, at our ranch house there at uh, Van Ness and Redondo Beach Boulevard, if the wind was right, you would have that nice mm. sweet aroma of the sweet peas. Mm. It, was so, it was something to behold that only I as a youngster can relate today. Mm. So that's where your ranch house was? Was on Redondo and Van Yes, Van but that was wow. not our the original house. That house was built by the Harris family. And the Harris Ranch originally started at Gramercy, where they had the, the, the water well. And that water well brought water all the way to Manhattan Beach Boulevard and Crenshaw. And the two uh, water lines were interconnected at the corner of Gramercy and 154th in case uh, there was a breakdown in it in uh, the well production, so that uh, no farmer was completely left without water. So, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, period between World War I and the Depression, uh, like I say, there was great building and subdividing going on. And my grandfather, uh, just prior to 1928, sold the 80 acres, uh, and it was subdivided by the son-in-law of Ben Long, who lived on the corner where the Calvary Church is. He had he had a small ranch, and uh, uh, he got it uh, all graded out, sidewalk and curbs, and then the depression hit, and we continued to farm. Uh, the blocks, that because there were no homes, but it wasn't paved. So uh, uh, during the uh, mid '30s, we were farming this land as alfalfa land, and water, like I say, being furnished by the Dickinson uh, pump. And uh, one day, my father was out here irrigating, and. Uh, uh, 
a vehicle drove up and the man got out and identified himself as uh, representing the Security Pacific Bank. They had uh, foreclosed on the Dickinson people and taken over. And uh, he uh, went on to inform my father that uh, the bank would like to sell this 80 acres. And uh, the purchase price was $33,500, $500 down. Well, my, mother, my father didn't say yes and he didn't say no. When he got home that night, he told my mother the story. She says, well, Carl, that, that was my dad's name, we do have $500 in the bank, but how do we pay the taxes? And uh, my father said, now you know why the bank wants to sell the property. <laughs> I'll stop right there uh, and go to another facet. During the 20s, when everything was going so great, the Harris Ranch, which now is occupied by El Camino College and the golf course, uh, the county supervisors decided this would make a great county go uh, park. And they got an initiative on the ballot box. And it was called the Matunat. And this land, of course, was in part of it. And uh, since things were going so great, the voters approved it almost 100%. And everything went fine until the Depression hit. And then people weren't paying their taxes. Now, the dirty part of that Matunat was if you didn't pay your taxes, your portion of the Mattoon Act, they put it into a pot, and then that total amount was severed, uh, put on your tax bill, even though you'd been paying your taxes, so the next year you had to pay. Well, it wound up in certain areas of, of uh, the valley here. They went on tax strike, and the county had to come in and do some bailout to get people paying taxes again. But that's the history of how uh, the uh, El Camino College and, and the uh, Alondra Park came to being. I don't know whether any of you people knew that. So, uh, back to the Dickinson Ranch with the uh, man from the bank. Three, three years later, in 1939, Herr Schickelgruber was rattling the sword over in Germany. And England was on pins and needles, and uh, they needed help. And we started building ships in Wilmington and San Peter on the Lend Lease program. I don't think anyone here is old enough to have gone through that period. Because of that, people that were coming out from the Dust Bowl areas, they needed a place to live. So, the, which is not, eventually became the Wilson uh, Home Builders, which built more homes in this whole area than any other builder, uh, purchased this land in 1939. Anyone want to guess what, what it sold for in just three years? $4,200. You mean the whole thing? Or? The whole 80 acres. Oh, no. $80,000. <laughs> Think what you could have made oh, wow. with, with the tax rate you had then. Yeah. Now, That's my folks I'm, I'm going to shake you up some more. <laughs> they graded out the this 40 acres starting at, at uh, Arlington. It's now Van Ness. And... and uh, you want to, anyone want to guess what the price of these houses were listed at? Six thousand. My folks paid about forty-two hundred in forty-two. Seventeen hundred dollars and fifty. Seventeen fifty. Wow. They sold like hotcakes. Because people had a steady job at the shipyards. Yeah. The aircraft was starting to open up a little bit. Yeah. So then they. Uh, did the other 40 acres off to Crenshaw. Same houses. Guess what? 
$2,750. And they sold my pocket. Seemed like it was working. Flipping them. <laughs> then in the meantime, the land that my grandfather had sold to Howard Hutton, the son-in-law of Ben Long, it started, uh, people were buying a few lots and building homes and selling them, and it eventually built up, but most of the homes south of 154th Street were larger homes than the ones here, especially the ones down towards Manhattan Beach Boulevard. So, uh, uh, what very few people realize, when Gardena High School was built in the late 1890s, it was known as Gardena Agricultural High School. And uh, at, uh, when I was going to Gardena High School, the high school owned 20 acres on the south side of Redondo Beach Boulevard uh, between Gramercy and Arlington or Van Ness. And uh, the school during the war instituted what they called a 4-4 program. And there were many students who were low level and rather than fade out and either join the Navy, which you could do those days at 16 and 9 months, uh, or uh, just go to work, say, at the shipyards, they spent four hours in the classroom, four hours on the farm, and they got paid for the four hours. Wow. Well, wow. let me tell you, a young man with a couple of dollars in his pocket, he didn't have any trouble getting a date to take a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Roy, do you want to tell them about how the our street got misnamed? Well, uh, when the people that bought this land filed the uh, papers for subdivision and and all, somehow either in in the way the titles, well, this was the Dickinson Ranch. On the other side, 154th, was uh, my grandfather's name showed on the title there. And somehow they left the S out, and so it became known as Perchy rather than Percy. Oh. And uh, so there, were, there were a couple periods of time that uh, uh, people thought, well, we ought to correct it. But let me tell you, uh, I've known other areas uh, here and around the United States where I've been, where uh, it's been more of a problem than it's worth. It, it isn't worth the hassle. Mm -hmm. People have, first of all, your deeds uh, show the purchase. Mm -hmm. That have to be changed. Oh. All your stationery, oh. your mailing address, oh. everything, it's just not worth it. So and this is this is before spell check, so you couldn't blame it. Human error all the way. <laughs> now, in 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 growing up, I, I was unique because uh, we in '39 my grandfather retired and my father took over uh, what was known as Percy Ranch, and. Uh, we moved into the big house, uh, the Harris. And uh, I'll give you a little story of how we acquired that house. When my grandparents moved from Culver City to the, this 80 acres just south of us, uh, there was just a ramshackle of a house. And uh, when it rained, uh, the, the roof leaked. And uh, my grandparents had a uh, apartment house downtown LA and my grandmother would uh, walk down uh, Arlington to catch the red car to go into LA to uh, get the receipts and make sure everything was going all right and uh, she stopped one day it was a warm day to admire the rose garden that was alongside the driveway going into the into the house and the lady came out 
and uh, uh, and uh, they introduce each other, and and uh, my grandmother said, "I sure wish we had a, had a house like this." She said, "Well, my husband and I have been talking recently about selling the house." <laughs> So that night when my mother, grandmother got home, she told my grandfather about the situation. He said, well, let's go talk to him. So that evening they came over to that house and bought the, the, the house. <laughs> now, that house remained in the family until my grandmother died and my dad and, and uncle decided to uh, <coughs> sell the property. I wish that I had uh, uh, brought, I've got an, a newspaper where it shows a dozer showing over the, the tank that uh, was the water source for our house. They'd already shoved the house over and it's now uh, Ralph's Market. <laughs> but uh, when we moved before I uh, uh, moved from next door to Nissan to uh, uh, the old Harris Ranch house there, uh, I got acquainted with some of my friends and uh, they were building uh, model airplanes. And so I got involved and, and uh, then uh, I found out that, uh, well, I need to digress a bit. In the mid-30s, a, a person by the name of Slim Kidwell, who was a very accomplished pilot, he came to my father and we were farming the 120 acres along Rosecrans on the south side, and he uh, wanted to open an airport. So he made a deal with my father and, and uh, it became known as the Guarding the Valley Airport. And I got my first ride in an old travel air by wing tail skidding plane. <laughs> so here the seed was set for my career to become a, a future fighter pilot. We realized that on the other side of Rosecrans they had a model airplane field, but these people had more money, so they had instead of rubber bar a powered uh, band propeller driven models that I was building, they had gasoline powered jobs. <laughs> so another neighbor kid and I would go up on Sunday afternoons, and and uh, those days they didn't have any radio control, so they had a timer, and sometimes the timers would stick, and the planes would go much further and we'd chase them for tip money. And with that tip money, I was able to uh, buy materials for building more model airplanes. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Mr. if Curry? anyone has any question, don't feel the, you can interrupt any time. Okay, I'll continue. <laughs> but we're going to have to kind of cut it off, so. Well, I'll make it real. Okay. Give me another five minutes. You got it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I graduated from high school and I was one of the youngest in the class, 17 years old. And in the Sunday paper right after graduation, the Army Air Corps had relaxed its qualifications. No longer was two years of college required to uh, go into air crew training. So I said, oh boy. This is right down my alley. So I told my folks, yeah, you can go down. They didn't think I'd pass the test. There was only 300 of us. It was supposed to be a minimum of three hours for the test. So I did it in a little under three hours. They said, come back at 1 o'clock and we'll announce the, the winners. Anyone want to guess how many pass out of a little over 300? Two. Just you. You. Just one. Just, just one. you. No, I don't know. That's a scary guess. Yeah. Six. Six. Wow. Then they said you got to go to the flight surgeon. 
he flunked three out. <laughs> so since I was underage, they said, you've got to go home and get three letters of, of uh, that you're a good character and all, and your parents have got to sign off on you so you can join the enlisted reserve corps, and then you'll be called up when after you're 18. Hmm. That happened, and off I went to basic training, Miami Beach, Florida. Mm. I had no idea what I was getting into. Because <laughs> here, I was one out of three, out of 300. Yeah. I got there and there, they did, uh, administered the psychomotor test, and I passed for pilot training. But a third of our class washed out. They went to gunnery, radio operator school, whatever. Then they said, well, you got to be an officer and a gentleman. They shipped me off to Michigan State College. Another third washed out. Then I go to pre-flight, mostly military training. Same thing. Third washed out. Now, you start looking at this pyramid deal. It's getting pretty narrow here. Top gun. <laughs> I didn't know that we were going to be in an experimental flight class. And when we got to Reddy, Texas, we had a fleet of brand new Stearman planes that were awaiting us. And uh, because they were noted for uh, spinning on, on landing, that was an automatic check ride on the way out, so a third of the class washed out. <laughs> And almost through, they announced your class is going to be extended. And they brought in expert acrobatic pilots, and uh, they wanted us to do all the acrobatics that we've been taught. I started it, and the guy says, oh, no, you got to do it at cruising airspeed. No extra airspeed. Mm -hmm. Well, I fell out of the maneuver. He did it perfectly. <laughs> Away they went, saying, we'll be back in a few weeks. Well, they came back. We were all waiting for them. We could do it. <laughs> but then, we didn't fly the basic training flying plane, the BT-13. We went right into advanced training, AT-6s. Washed out quite a few more, but we also killed a few, too. And then I went on into... Uh, uh, advanced flying the T-6, and since I, when I graduated, I had so much T-6 time, they made me an IP for people that were being liberated from the World War II camps, and they wanted to get them rehab to send them to uh, South Pacific. Well, those guys said, I've been there and done that, no more flying for me. <laughs> so that was the deal, and that's when I got introduced in, into uh, aircraft maintenance, we were killing at least a pilot a week because all the good mechanics were being shipped to the South Pacific. And my career uh, wound up, uh, I became uh, not only a qualified fighter pilot flying Mustangs and F-80 jets and other aircraft, but I also at one time I was the wing uh, maintenance officer. I retired as a lieutenant colonel in wow. 72. Nice. Right. Yeah. One, 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 one side note I want to make. The class of 43, winter and summer, produced more commissioned officers than any other class out of Gardena High School. Wow. Wow. We had six or seven commissioned officers. Out of, out of my class. At what point did you shift from biplane to monoplane? Uh, when I went to uh, basic flying training. I, if anyone wants to look, I've, I've got my basic flying book here. And I also got the uh, uh, yearbook of the... Uh, oh, this is the... This is the yearbook. And, it, and it, uh, there's a picture in here of the of the high school farm and with a horse somewhere in here if someone wants to look at it. And 
I brought this. I'll let you. Uh, What was this? Oh. If anyone wants to look at that. I'm, okay. In fact, I got extra copies. You can have that. Copy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much. You.